Chapter Four of Captives of the Flame by Samuel R. Delaney. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four. She made a note on her pad, put down her slide rule, and picked up a pearl snap with which she fastened together the shoulder panels of her white dress. The maid said, "Ma'am, shall I do your hair now?" One second, Clea said. She turned to page 328 of her integral tables, checked the increment of subcosine A plus B over the nth root of A to the nth plus B to the nth, and transferred it to her notebook. Ma'am? asked the maid. She was a thin woman, about thirty. The little finger of her left hand was gone. You can start now. Clea leaned back in the beauty hammock and lifted the dark mass of her hair from her neck. The maid caught the ebony wealth with one hand and reached for the end of the four yards of silver chain strung with alternate pearls and diamonds, each inch and a half. Ma'am? asked the maid again. What are you figuring on? I'm trying to determine the inverse subtrigonometric functions. Dalen Golga, he was my mathematics professor at the university, discovered the regular ones, but nobody's come up with the inverses yet. Oh, said the maid. She ceased weaving the jeweled chain a moment, took a comb, and whipped it through a cascade of hair that fell back on Clea's shoulder. Eh, what are you going to do with them once you find them? Actually, said Clea, ouch! Oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Please. Actually, went on Clea, they'll be perfectly useless, at least as far as anyone knows now. They exist, so to speak, in a world that has little to do with ours. Like the world of imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one. Eventually, we may find use for them, perhaps in the same way we use imaginary numbers to find the roots of equations of a higher order than two because cosine theta plus i sine theta equals e to the i sine theta which lets us ma'am well that is to say they haven't been able to do anything like that with the sub trigonometric functions yet but they're fun bend your head a little to the left ma'am was the maid's comment. Clea bent. You're going to look beautiful. Four and five fingers wove deftly in her hair. Just beautiful. I hope that Tomar can get here. It's not going to be any fun without him. But isn't the king coming? asked the maid. I saw his acceptance note myself. You know it was on very simple paper, very elegant. My father will enjoy that a good deal more than I will. My brother went to school with the king before, before his majesty's coronation. That's amazing, said the maid. Were they friends? Just think of it. Do you know whether they were friends or not? Clea shrugged. And oh, said the maid, continuing, have you seen the ballroom? All the orders are real imported fish. You can tell because they're smaller than the ones your father grows. I know, smiled Clea. I don't think I've ever eaten any of my dad's fish in my life, which is sort of terrible, actually. They're supposed to be very good. Oh, they are, ma'am. They are. Your father is a fine man to grow such great good fishes, but you must admit there's something special about the ones that come from the coast. I tasted one on my way up through the pantry, so I know. What exactly is it? Clea asked, turning around. The maid frowned, and then smiled, and nodded wisely. Oh, I know, I know, you can tell the difference. At that moment, John Kosher was saying, Well, so far you've been right. He appeared to be more or less standing. The room was dim, so his head and hands were invisible more or less alone. Yeah, I trust you. I don't have much choice, he added, in the pantry of his father's mansion. Suddenly, his voice took a different tone. Look, I will trust you, with part of me anyway. 
I've been caged up for nearly five years for something stupid I did, and for something that no matter how hard I try, I can't convince myself was all my fault. I don't mean that Oscar should be blamed, but chance and all the rest. Well, all I mean is it makes me want out that much more. I want to be free. I nearly got myself killed trying to escape from the mines, and a couple of people did get killed helping me. All right, you got me out of that stainless steel graveyard I wandered into back at the radiation barrier, and for that, thanks. I mean it, but I'm not free yet, and I still want out more than anything in the world. Sure, I know that you want me to do something, but I don't understand it yet. You say you'll tell me soon. Okay, but you're riding around in my head like this, so I'm not free yet. If that's what I have to do to get free, then I'll do it. But I'm warning you. If I see another crack in the wall, another spot of light getting in, I'll claw my hands off trying to break through and to hell with what you want. Because while you're there, I can't be free. Suddenly, the light in the pantry flipped on. His sudden face went from the tautness of his last speech to fear. He had been standing by the side of a seven-foot porcelain storage cabinet. He jumped back to the wall. Whoever had come in, a butler or caterer, was out of sight on the other side. A hand came around the edge of the cabinet, reaching for the handle. The hand was broad, wiry with black hair, and sported a cheap, wide brass ring set with an irregular shape of blue glass. As the door opened, the hand swung out of sight. There was a clatter of dishes on the shelves, the slide of crockery slipping over plastic racks, and a voice. All right, there, you carry this one. Then a grunt, and the kerflop of the latch as the door slammed to. A moment later, the light and John Koshar's hands and head went out. When John stepped forward again, he looked at the pantry, at the doors, the cabinets. The familiarity hurt. There was a door that opened into the main kitchen. Once he had snagged a carva fruit from the cook's table and ran. As behind him, a wooden salad bowl crashed to the floor. The sound made him whirl, in time to catch the cook's howl and to see the pale shreds of lettuce strewn across the black tile floor. The bowl was still spinning. He had been nine. He started slowly for the door to the hallway that led to the dining room. In the hall was a red wood table on which sat a free-form sculpture of aluminum rods and heavy glass spheres. That was unfamiliar. Not the table, the sculpture. A slight highlight along the curve of crystal brought back to him, for a moment, the blue ceramic vase that had been there in his memory. It was coated with glaze that was shot through with myriad cracks. It was cylindrical, straight, then suddenly veering to a small mouth, slightly off-center. The burnished red wood behind the vivid turquoise blue was a combination that was almost too rich, too sensual. He had broken the vase. He had broken it in surprise when his sister had come in on him suddenly. The little girl with hair black as his own, only more of it, saying, What are you doing, John? And he had jumped, turned, and then the vase was lying in fragments on the floor, like a lot of bright, brittle leaves made out of stone. He remembered his first reaction had been, oddly, surprise at finding that the glaze covered the inside as well as the outside of the vase. He was fourteen. He walked to the family dining room and stepped inside. With a ballroom in use, no one would come here. Stepping into the room was like stepping into a cricket's den. The subtle tsk tsk of a thousand clocks, repeated and repeated, overlapping and melting with no clear, discernible rhythm. The wall by the door was lined with shelves, and they were filled with his father's collection of chronometers. He looked at the clocks on the shelf level with his eye. The last time he had been in this room, it had been the shelf below. The light from the door made a row of crescents on the curved faces, some the size of his little fingernail, others the diameter of his head. 
their hands were invisible, their settings were dim. In his memory, they went from simple gold to ornately carved silver, and one was set in an undersea bower with jeweled shells and coral branches. There must be many new clocks after five years, he thought. If he turned on the light, how many would he recognize? When he was eighteen, he had stood in this room and examined the thin, double prong of a fire blade. The light in the room was off, and as he flicked the button on the hilt and the white sparks leapt out and up the length of the blade, the crescents flamed on the edges of the clock faces all along the wall. Later, at the royal palace, with that same blade, there had been the same sudden, clumsy fear at discovery, fear clotting into panic, the panic turning to confusion, and the confusion metastasizing into fear again. Only fear all through him, dragging him down, so that when he tried to run down the vaulted hall, his feet were too heavy, so that when he tripped against the statue in the alcove, whirled upon the pursuing guard, and swung the white needle of energy down, and the guard's flesh hissed and fell away, a moment of blood spurring under pale flame. Almost immediately he was exhausted. They took him easily after that. Clumsy, he thought. Not with his fingers. He had fixed many of these clocks when his father had acquired them in various states of disrepair. But with his mind. His emotions were not fine and drawn, but rather great shafts of anger or fear fell about him without focus or apparent source disgust, or even love, when he had felt it was vague, liable to metamorphosize from one to the other. School was great. His history teacher was very good. School was noisy. The kids were pushy and didn't care about anything. His blue parakeet was delicate and beautiful. He had taught it to whistle. There were always crumbs on the bottom of the cage. Changing the paper was a nuisance. Then there had been five years of prison, and the first sharp feeling pierced his mind, as sharp as the uncoiled hairspring of a clock, as sharp as jewels in a poison ring. It was a wish, a pain, an agony for freedom. The plans for escape had been intricate, yet sharp as the cracks in blue ceramic clays. The hunger for escape was a hand against his stomach, and as the three of them had, at last, waited in the rain, by the steps, it had tightened unbearably. Then, then, with all the sharpness, what had made him lose the others? Why had he wandered in the wrong direction? Clumsy! And he wanted to be free of that, and wonder if that was what he had wanted to be free of all along. While he had sputtered at the prison guards, choked on the food, and could not communicate his outrage. Then, at the horizon, was the purple glow of something paler than sunrise, deadlier than the sea, a flickering, luminous purple gauze behind the hills. Near him were the skeletons of broken, century-ancient trees, leafless, nearly petrified. The crumbly dirt looked as if it had been scattered over the land in handfuls, loosely bearing neither shrubs or footprints by one boulder a trickle of black water ran beneath a fallen log catching dim light in the ripples on either side he looked up on the horizon against the lines of light as though cut no torn from carbon paper was the silhouette of a city tower behind tower rose against the pearly haze a net of roadways wound among the spires then he made out one minuscule thread of metal that ran from the city in his general direction but veering to the right it passed him half a mile away and at last disappeared into the edge of the jungle that he could see now behind him telfar the word came to his mind as though on a sign attached with springs to his consciousness. The radiation! That was the second thing he thought of. Once more the name of the city shivered in his brain. Telfar! The certain, very certain death 
he had wandered into caught the center of his gut like a fist. It was almost as if the name were sounding out loud in his skull. Then he stopped, because he realized he had heard something, a, a voice. Very definitely, he heard it. Music had started. He could hear it coming from the ballroom now. The party must be underway. He looked out into the hall, a fellow in a white apron, holding an empty tray on which were crumbs from small cakes, was coming toward him. "'Excuse me, sir,' the man in the apron said. "'Guests aren't supposed to be in this part of the house.' "'I was trying to find the—' uh, <clears throat> John coughed. The man in the apron smiled. "'Oh, of course. Go back into the ballroom and take the hall to your left down three doors. Thank you.' John smiled back and hurried up the hallway. He entered the ballroom by way of a high, arched alcove, in which were small white meat, red meat, dark meat of fish, ground into patties, cut into stars, strips of fillet wound into imitation seashells, tiny braised shrimp, and stuffed baby smelts. A ten-piece orchestra, three bass radiolins, a theremin, and six blown shells of various sizes was making a slow windy music from the dais the scattering of guests seemed lost in the great room john wandered across the floor here and there were stainless steel fountains in which blue or pink liquid fanned over mounds of crushed ice each fountain was rimmed with a little shelf on which was a ring of glasses he picked a glass up let a spout of pink fill it and walked on, sipping slowly. Suddenly, the loudspeaker announced the arrival of Mr. Quelar Da and party. Heads turned, and a moment later, a complex of glitter, green silk, blue net, and diamonds at the top of the six wide marble steps across the room resolved into four ladies and their escorts. John glanced up at the balcony that ran around the second story of the room. A short gentleman in a severe, unornamented blue suit was coming toward the head of the steps which expanded down toward the ballroom floor with a grace and approximate shape of a swan's wing. The gentleman hurried down the pale cascade. John sipped his drink. It was sweet with the combined flavors of a dozen fruits, with a whisper of alcohol bitter at the back of his tongue. The gentleman hurried across the floor, passing within yards of him. Father! The impact was the same as the recognition of Telfar. The hair was thinner than it had been five years ago. He was much heavier. His father was at the other side of the room already, checking with the waiters. John pulled his shoulders in and let his breath out. It was the familiarity, not the change that hurt. It took some time before the room filled. There was a lot of space. One guest, John noted, was a young man in military uniform. He was powerful, squat, in a taurine way, usually associated with older men. There was a major's insignia on his shoulder. John watched him a while, empathizing with his occasional looks that told how out of place he felt. He took neither food nor drink but prowled a ten-foot area by the side of the balcony steps. Waiting, John thought. A half an hour later, the floor was respectably populated. John had exchanged a few words at last with a soldier. John. A beautiful party, don't you think? Soldier, with embarrassment. Yes, sir. John. I guess the war is worrying all of us. Soldier. The war? Yes. Then he looked away, not inclined to talk more. John was now near the door. Suddenly, the loudspeaker announced, The party of His Royal Majesty, the King. Gowns rustled, the talk rose, people turned and fell back from the entrance. The King's party, headed by himself and a tall, electric-looking, red-headed woman, his senior by a handful of years, appeared at the top of the six marble steps. As they came down, right and left, 
people bowed. John dropped his head, but not before he realized that the king's escort had given him a very direct look. He glanced up again, but now her emerald train was sweeping down the aisle the people had left open. Her insignia, he remembered, told him she was a duchess. Coming up the aisle in the other direction now between the bowing crowds was old Koshar. He bowed very low, and the pale blonde young man raised him, and they shook hands, and Koshar spoke. Your Majesty, he began warmly. Sir, answered the king, smiling. I haven't seen you since you were a boy at school. The king smiled again, this time rather wanly. Koshar hurried on, but I would like to introduce my daughter to you, for it's her party. Clea? The old man turned to the balcony stairs, and the crowd's eyes turned with him. She was standing on the top step, in a white dress made of panel over silken panel, held with pearl clasps. Her black hair cascaded across one shoulder, webbed and rewebbed with a chain of silver strung with pearls. Her hands at her sides, she came down the stairs. People stepped back. She smiled and walked forward. John watched while at last his sister reached his father's side. My daughter, Clea, said old Koshar to the king. Charmed. Koshar raised his left hand, and the musicians began the introduction to the changing partners' dance. John watched the king take Clea in his arms, and also saw the soldier move toward them, and then stop. A woman in a smoky gray dress suddenly blocked his view, smiled at him, and said, Will you dance? He smiled back to avoid another expression, and she was in his arms. Apparently the soldier had had a similar experience, for at the first turn of the music John saw the soldier was dancing too. A few couples away, Clea and the king turned round and round, white and white, brunette and blonde. The steps came back to John like a poem remembered, the turn, the dip, separate, and join again. When a girl does the strange little outward step and the boy bows, so that for a moment she is out of sight, her gown always swishes, just so. Yes, like that. This whole day had been filled with the sudden remembrances of tiny facts like that, forgotten for five years, at once relearned with startling vividness that shocked him. The music signaled for partners to change, gowns whirled into momentary flowers, and he was dancing with a brown-haired woman the soldier had been dancing with a moment before. Looking to his left, he saw that the soldier had somehow contrived to get Clea for a partner. Moving closer, he overheard. I didn't think you were going to get here at all. I'm so glad, from Clea. I could have even come earlier, Tomar said, but you'd have been busy. You could have come up. And once I got here, I didn't think we'd get a chance to talk, either. Well, you've got one now. Better make it quick. We change partners in a moment. What happened to the scouting planes? All crippled. Didn't sight a thing. They got back to base almost before I did this morning. The report was nothing. What about the picnic, Clea? We can have it on... A burst of music signaled the change. John did not hear the day, but expected his sister to whirl into his arms. But instead, he saw her white dress flare and turn by him, an emerald iridescence caught in his eye, then rich mahogany flame. He was dancing with the Duchess. She was nearly his height, and watched him with a smile, hung in the subtle area between friendship and knowing cynicism. She moved easily, and he had just remembered that he ought to smile back to be polite when the music sounded the change. The instant before she whirled away, he heard her say very distinctly, Good luck! John Koshar. His name brought him to a halt, and he stared after her. When he did turn back to his new partner, surprise still on his face, 
His eyes were filled with sudden whiteness. It was Clea. He should have been dancing, but he was standing still. When she looked at his face to discover why, she suddenly drew a breath. At first he thought his head had disappeared again. Then, as shock and surprise became suddenly as real as her wide eyes, her open mouth, he whispered, Clea, and her hand went to her mouth. Clumsy, he thought, and the word was a sudden ache in his hands and chest. Reach for her. Dance. As his hands went out, the music stopped, and the languid voice of the king came over the loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Toraman, I have just received a message from the council that necessitates an announcement to you as my friends and loyal subjects. I have been requested by the council to make their declaration of war official by my consent. An emergency meeting over sudden developments has made it imperative that we begin immediate action against our most hostile enemies on the mainland. Therefore, before you all, I declare the Empire of Toraman to be at war. In the silence, John looked for his sister, but she was gone. Someone near the microphone cried out, Long live the king! Then the cry echoed again. The musicians started the music once more. Partners found one another, and the talking and laughing grew in his ears like waves, like crumbling rock, like the cutter teeth clawing into the rock face of the ore deposits. John shook his head, but he was in his own house. Yes, his room was on the second floor, and he could go up and lie down, and by his bed would be the copper night table and the copy of Delcord the Whaler, which he had been reading the night before. He'd left the ballroom and gotten halfway down the hall before he remembered that his room was probably not his room any longer, and that he certainly couldn't go up to it and lie down. He was standing in front of the door of one of the sitting rooms that opened off the hall. The door was ajar, and from it he heard a woman's voice. Well, can't you do something about his index of refraction? If he's going to be doing any work at night, you can't have him popping on and off like a cigarette lighter. There was silence. Then, well, at least don't you think he should be told more than he knows now? Fine, so do I, especially since the war has been officially declared. John took a breath and stepped in. A emerald train whirled across the duller green of the carpet as she turned. The bright hair, untontured save by two coral combs, fell behind her shoulders. Her smile showed faint surprise, very faint. Who were you talking to? John Kosher asked. Mutual friends, the Duchess said. They were alone in the room. After a moment, John said, What do they want us to do? It's treason, isn't it? The Duchess's eyes went thin. Are you serious? she asked. You call that treason, keeping these idiots from destroying themselves, eating themselves up in a war with a nameless enemy, something so powerful that if there were any consideration of real fighting, we could be destroyed with a thought. Do you remember who the enemy is? You've heard his name. There are only three people in Tormund who have john koshar everyone else is ignorant so we're the only ones who can say we're fully responsible that responsibility is to torment have you any idea what state the economy is in your own father is responsible for a good bit of it but if he closed down his aquariums now the panic he would cause would equal the destruction their being open already causes the empire is snowballing towards its own destruction, and it's going to take it out in the war. You call trying to prevent it treason? Whatever we call it, we don't have much choice, do we? With people like you around, I'm not sure it isn't a bad idea. Look, said John, I was cooped up in a prison mine way out beyond nowhere for five years. All I wanted was out, see? All I wanted was to get free. Well, I'm back in Toron, and I'm still not free. First of all, 
said the Duchess. If it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be as free as you are now. After a day of clean clothes and walking in fresh air, if you're not well on the road to what you want, then I'd better change some ideas of my own. I want something too, John Koshar. When I was seventeen, I worked for a summer in your father's aquarium. My nine hours a day were spent with a metal spoon about the size of your head, scraping the bottoms of the used tank tube of the stuff that even the glass filters were too touchy to take out. Afterwards, I was too tired to do much more than read. So I read. Most of it was about Toromon's history. I read a lot about the mainland expeditions. Then, in my first winter out of school, I lived in a fishing village at the edge of the forest, studying what I could of the customs of the forest people. I made sketches of their temples, tried to map their nomadic movements. I even wrote an article on the architecture of their temporary shelters that was published in the university journal. Well, what I want is for Toromon to be free, free of its own ridiculous self-entanglements. Perhaps, coming from the royal family, I had a easier path toward a sense of Toromon's history. At its best, that's all an aristocracy is good for anyway. But I wanted more than a sense. I wanted to know what it was worth. So I went out and looked, and I found out it was worth a whole lot. Somehow, Tormann is going to have to pick itself up by the back of the neck and give itself a shaking. If I have to be the part that does the shaking, then I will. That's what I want, John Koshar, and I want it as badly as you want to be free. John was quiet a moment. Then he said, Anyway, to get what we want, I guess we more or less have to do the same thing. All right, I'll go along but you're going to have to explain some things to me. There's a lot I still don't understand. A lot we both don't, the Duchess said. But we know this. They're not from Earth. They're not human. And they come from very far away, inconceivably far. What about the rest? They'll help us help Tormon if we help them. How, I still don't understand for sure. Already I've arranged to have Prince Let kidnapped. Kidnapped? But why? Because if we get through this, Toromon is going to need a strong king. And I think you'll agree that Usk will never quite make that. Also, he's ill and under any great strain might die in a moment. Not to mention the underground groups that are bound to spring up to undermine whatever the government decides to do, once the war gets going. Let is going where he can become a strong man, with the proper training, so that if anything happens to Usk, he can return and there will be someone to guide the government through its crises. After that, how we're to help them, I'm not sure. I see said john how did they get hold of you anyway for that matter how did they get me you they contacted you just outside of telfar didn't they they had to rearrange the molecular structure of some of your more delicate proteins and do a general overhaul on your subcrystalline structure so the radiation wouldn't kill you that unfortunately had the unpleasant side effect of booting down your index of refraction a couple of points, which is why you keep fading in dim light. In fact, I got a blow-by-blow -blow description of your entire escape from them. It kept me on the edge of my seat all night. How was I contacted? The same way you were, suddenly, and with those words, Lord of the Flames. Now, your first direct assignment will be... In another room, Clea was sitting on a blue velvet hassock, with her hands tight in her lap. Then, suddenly, they flew apart like springs, shook beside her head, and then clasped again. Tomar, she said. Please, excuse me, but I'm upset. It was so strange. When I was dancing with the king, he told me how he had dreamed of my brother this morning. I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was just small talk. Then, just after I changed partners for the third time, there I was, staring into a face that 
I could have sworn was John's. And the man wasn't dancing, either. He was just looking at me. Very funny. And then he said my name. Tomar, it was the same voice John used to use when I'd hurt myself, and he wanted to help. Oh, it couldn't have been him, because he was too tall and too gaunt, and the voice was just a little too deep. But it was so much like what he might have been. That was when the king made his announcement. I just turned and ran. The whole thing seemed supernatural. Oh, don't worry. I'm not superstitious, but it unnerved me. And that, plus what you said this morning. What I said? asked Tomar. He stood beside the hassock in the blue-draped sitting room, his hands in his pockets, listening with animal patience. About their drafting all the degree students into the war effort. Maybe the war is good, but Tomar, I'm working on another project, and all at once the thing I want most in the world is to be left alone to work on it. And I want you, and I want to have a picnic. I'm nearly at the solution now, and to have to stop and work on bomb sightings and missile trajectories. Tomar, there's a beauty in abstract mathematics that shouldn't have to be dulled with that sort of thing. Also, maybe you'll go away, or I'll go away. That doesn't seem fair, either. Tomar, have you ever had things you wanted, had them in your hands, and suddenly have a situation come up that made it look like they might fly out of your grip forever? Tomar rubbed his hand across his brush-cut red hair and shook his head. There was a time once when I wanted things, like food, work, and a bed where all four legs touched the ground. So I came to Torun, and I got them, and I got you, and so I guess there isn't anything else to want or want that bad, he grinned, and the grin made her smile. I guess, she started, I guess it was just that he looked so much like my brother. Clea, Tomar said, about your brother. I wasn't going to tell you this until later. Maybe I shouldn't say it now. But you were asking whether or not they were going to draft prisoners into the army, and whether, at the end of their service, they'd be freed. Well, I did some checking. They are going to, and I sent through a recommendation that they take your brother among the first bunch. In three hours, I got a memorandum from the penal commissioner. Your brother's dead. She looked at him hard trying to hold her eyes open and to prevent the little snarl of sound that was a sob from loosening in the back of her throat. In fact, it happened last night, Tomar went on. He and two others attempted an escape. Two of their bodies were found, and there's no chance that the third one could have escaped alive. The snarl collapsed into a sound she would not make. She sat for a moment. Then she said, Let's go back to the party. She stood up, and they walked across the white rug to the door. Once she shook her head and opened her mouth. Then she closed it again and went on. Yes, I'm glad you said it. I don't know. Maybe it was a sign. She stopped. No, it wasn't. It wasn't anything, was it? No. They went down the steps to the ballroom once more. The music was very, very happy. End of chapter 4A few hours earlier, Jaron gave Tell a carba fruit. The boy took the bright speckled melon around the inn, looking for Alter. Unable to find her, he wandered onto the street and up the block. Once, a cat with a struggling gray shape in its teeth hurtled across his path. Later, he saw an overturned garbage can with a filigree of fish bones ornamenting the party-colored heap. On the house roofs, across the street, the taller buildings and towers of Torin paled to blue 
with sudden yellow rectangles of window light scattered unevenly over their faces turning down another block he saw rara standing on the corner stopping the occasional passers-by tell started up to her but she saw him and motioned him away puzzled he went to a stoop and sat down to watch as he ran his thumbnail along the orange rind and the juice oozed from the slit he heard rara talking to a stranger your fortune sir i'll spread your future before you like a silver mirror the stranger passed rara turned to a woman now coming toward her ma'am a fragment of a unit will spread your life out like a patterned carpet where you may trace the designs of your fate just a quarter of a unit the woman smiled but shook her head you look like you come from the mainland rara called after her well good luck here in the new world sister the island of opportunity immediately she turned to another man this one in a deep green uniform sir tell heard her begin again then she paused as she surveyed his costume sir she continued for a single unit i will unweave the threads of your destiny from eternity's loom would you like to know the promotion about to come your way how many children you'll come on lady said the man in uniform it's illegal to tell fortunes here but i've got a license declared rara i'm a genuine clairvoyant just a second and her hands began to plunge into the seams and pockets of her gray rags never mind lady just get moving and he gave her a push rara moved tell peeled back the strip of rind he'd loosened from the carva fruit licked the juice from the yellow wound and followed rara son of an electric eel she said when tell reached her her birthmark scarlet just trying to make a living that's all want a bite rara shook her head i'm too angry she said they walked back to the inn do you know where alter is tell asked i was looking for her she's not in the inn i couldn't find her there did you look on the roof rara asked oh said tell no they turned into the tavern and tell went upstairs it was not until he was halfway up the ladder on the second floor that went to the trap door in the ceiling that he wondered why she was on the roof he pushed the trap door back and hoisted himself to the dusty weathered rim alter was hanging head and white hair down from a pipe that went from the stone chimney to a supporting pipe that was fastened by a firm collar to the roof what are you doing tell asked hi she smiled down at him i'm practicing practicing what she was hanging double from her waist over the pipe now she grabbed the bar close to her waist and somersaulted forward letting her feet slowly and evenly to the ground her legs perfectly straight my stunts she said i'm an acrobat she did not let go of the bar but suddenly swung her legs up so that her ankles nearly touched her hands and then whipped them down again ending the kick by supporting herself upright on the metal perch then she flung her legs back tell jumped because she looked like she was going to fall and went out and down then under swung up arced over and went down again in a giant circle she circled once more then doubled up caught one knee over the bar reversed direction and suddenly was sitting on top of the rod with one leg over gee tell said how did you do that it's all timing alter said suddenly she threw her head back and circled the bar once more hanging from her hands and one knee then the knee came loose and her feet came slowly to the ground you've just got to be strong enough to hold up your own weight maybe a little stronger but the rest is all timing you mean i could do that you want to try something like what come here and grab hold of the bar tell came over and grabbed he could just keep his feet flat on the tar-papered roof and still hold on all right he said now pull yourself up and hook your left knee around the bar 
like this? He kicked up once, missed, and tried again. When you kick, throw your head back, she instructed. You'll balance better. He did, pulled up, and got his foot through his arms, and suddenly felt the bar slide into the crook of his knee. He was hanging by his left knee and hands. Now what do I do? he asked, swaying back and forth. Alter put her hand on his back to steady him. Now straighten your right leg and keep your arms fairly straight. He obeyed. Now swing your right leg up and down three times, and then swing it down real hard. Tell lifted his leg, dropped it, and at once began swinging back and forth beneath the pole. Keep the leg straight, Alter said. Don't bend it, or you'll lose momentum. He got to the third kick, and then let go, with his thigh muscles, not his hands, and at once the sky slipped back behind him, and his body swung upward, away from the direction of the kick. Woo! he said, and then felt an arm steadying his wrist. He was sitting on top of the bar with one leg over it. He looked down at Alter. Is that what was supposed to happen? Sure, she said. That's how you mount the bar. It's called a knee mount. I guess it's easier than climbing. Now, what do I do? Try this. Straighten out your arms and make sure they stay straight. Now, straighten your back leg behind you. As he tried, he felt her hand on his knee, helping. Hey, he said. I'm not balanced. Don't worry, she said. I'm holding you. Keep those arms straight. If you don't obey instructions, you'll have a head full of tar paper. Seven feet isn't very high, but head first, it's sort of uncomfortable. Tell's elbows locked. Now, when I count three, kick the leg I'm holding under you and throw your head back as hard as you can. One. What's supposed to happen? Tell demanded. Follow instructions, replied Alter. Two. Three. Tell threw and kicked, and felt Alter give his leg an extra push. He had planned to close his eyes, but what he saw kept them open. Sky and then Roof were coming at him fast. Then they veered away, along with Alter's face, which was upside down, till an instant later the pale blue towers of Toron, all pointing in the wrong direction, pierced his sight. Riding themselves, they jerked out of his line of vision, and he was looking straight up at the sky. There was a star out, he noted, before it became a meteor, and flashed away, until it was replaced by the roof and Alter's face, laughing now, and then once more everything swept into its proper position for a moment. He clamped his stinging hands tightly on the bar, and when he felt himself stop, he hunched forward and closed his eyes. Mmm, he said. Alter's hand was on his wrist, very firm, and he was sitting on top of the bar again. You just did a double back knee circle, she said. You did it very well, too. And then she laughed. Only it wasn't supposed to be a double. You just kept going. How do I get down? Tell asked. Arms straight, said Alter. Tell straightened his arms. Put this hand over here. She patted the bar on the other side of his leg. Tell transferred his grip. Now bring your leg off the bar. Tell hoisted his leg back so that he was supported by just his hands. Now bend forward and roll over, slowly if you can. Tell rolled, felt the bar slip from where it was pressed against his waist, and a moment later his feet were brushing back and forth over the tar paper. He let go and rubbed his hands together. Why didn't you tell me what I was going to do? Because then you wouldn't have done it. Now that you know you can, the rest will be easier. You've got three stunts now in less than five minutes. The knee mount, back knee circle, and the forward dismount. And that was the best I've ever seen anybody do for a first try. Thanks, said Tell. He looked back up at the horizontal bar. You know, it feels real funny doing that stuff. 
I mean, you don't really do it. You do things, and then it happens to you. That's right, Alter said. I hadn't thought of it like that. Maybe that's why a good acrobat has to be a person who can sort of relax and just let things happen. You have to trust both your mind and your body. Oh, said Tell, I was looking for you when I came up here. I wanted to give you something. Thank you, she smiled, brushing a shock of white hair from her forehead. I hope it didn't get broken. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of something sinewy. He had strung the shells on lengths of leather thong. There were three loops of leather, each longer than the one before, and the shells were spread apart and held in place by tiny knots. Jaron gave me the thong, and I put it together this afternoon. It's a necklace, see? She turned while he tied the ends behind her neck. Then she turned back to him, touching the green brilliance of one frail cornucopia, passing to the muted orange of another along the brown leather band. Thank you, she said. Thank you very much, Tell. You want some fruit? he said, picking up the globe and beginning to peel the rest of it. All right, she said. He broke it open, gave her half, and they went to the edge of the roof and leaned on the balustrade, looking to the street below, then over the roofs of the other houses of the Devil's Pot and up to the darkening towers. You know, Tell said, I've got a problem. No identification papers? No place to go? I should say you do. Not like that, he said. But that's part of it, I guess. I guess it's a large part of it, but not all. Then what is it? I've got to figure out what I want. Here I am, in a new place, with no way to get anything for myself. I've got to figure a goal. Look, said Alter, assuming the superiority of age and urban training. I'm a year older than you, and I don't know where I'm going yet. But when I was your age, it occurred to me it would probably all take care of itself. All I had to do was write it out, so that's what I've been doing, and I haven't been too unhappy. Maybe it's the difference between living here or on the seashore. But here you've got to spend a lot of time looking for the next meal. At least people like you and me have to. If you pay attention to that, you'll find yourself heading in the right direction soon enough. Whatever you're going to be, you're going to be, if you just give yourself half a chance. Like a big acrobatic stunt, huh? asked Tell. You just do the right things, and then it happens to you. Like that, said Alter. I guess so. Maybe, said Tell. The carb of fruit was cool, sweet, like honey, orange, and pineapple. A minute later, someone was calling them. They turned from the balustrade and saw Jaron's white head poking from the trap door. Come down, he demanded. I've been looking all over for you. It's time. They followed him back to the first floor. Tell saw that the scarred giant was still sitting at the table, his hands folded into quiet hammers before him. Now, everyone, Jaron called as he sat down at the table. Somewhat reluctantly, people left the bar. Jaron dropped a sheaf of papers on the table. Come around, everyone. The top sheet was covered with fine writing and careful architectural drawing. Now, this is the plan. So were the other sheets when Jaron turned them over. First, I'll divide you into groups. He looked at the giant across the table. Arkor, you take the first group. He picked out six more men and three women. He turned to the white-haired girl now. Alter, you'll be with a special group. He named six more people. Tell was among them. A third group was formed, which Jaron himself was to lead. Arkor's group was for strong-arm work. Jaron's was for guard duty and to keep the way clear while the prince was being conveyed back to the inn. The people in the special group already know what to do. Sir, said Tell, you haven't told me yet. Jaron looked at him. You have to get caught. Sir? You go past the guards and make enough noise so that they catch you. Then, when they're occupied with you, we'll break in. 
because you have no papers they won't be able to trace you am i supposed to stay caught of course not you'll get away when we distract them oh said tell jaron went back to the papers as the plan was reviewed tell saw two things first the completeness of the research information and attention to detail habits of individual guards one who left at the first sound of the chain signal another who waited a moment to exchange greetings with his replacement a friend from his military academy days second he saw its complexity there were so many ins and outs gears that had to mesh movements to be timed within seconds that tell wondered if everything could possibly go right while he was wondering they were suddenly already on their way each one with a bit of the plan fixed firmly in his mind no one with too clear a picture of the entire device the groups were split into subgroups of two or three then reconvened at appointed spots around the castle tell and alter found themselves walking through the city with the giant occasional street lights wheeled their shadows over the cracked pavement you're from the forest aren't you tell finally asked the giant he nodded why did you come here tell asked trying to make conversation as they walked i wanted to see the city he said raising his hand to his scars with a small chuckle after that he said nothing prime minister charnel took his evening constitutional along the usually deserted avenue of the oyster at about this time every night prime minister Chardon always carried on him a complete set of keys to the private suites of the royal family this evening however a drunk in rags reeled out of a side street and collided with the old man a moment later making profuse apologies he backed away ducking his head his hands behind his back when the drunk returned to the side street his weaving gait ceased his hand came from behind his back and in it was a complete set of keys to the private suites of the royal family the guard who was in charge of checking the alarm system loved flowers he could and had been observed going to the florists at least once a week on his time off so when the old woman with a tray of scarlet anemones came by and offered them for his perusal it is not surprising that he lowered his head over the tray and filled his lungs with that strange pungent smell somewhere between orange rind and the sea wind forty-seven seconds later he yawned fourteen seconds after that he was sitting on the ground his head hung forward snoring through the gate two figures could be seen at the alarm box had anyone been there to look at another entrance to the castle two guards converged on a fourteen-year-old boy with black hair and green eyes who was trying to climb the fence hey get down from there all right come on where are your papers what do you mean you don't have any come on with us get the camera out joe we'll have to photograph him and send the picture to chief records headquarters they'll tell us who you are kid now hold still behind them a sudden white-haired figure was out of the shadows and over the gate in a moment the guards did not see her hold still now kid while i get your retina pattern later on a bunch of rowdies led by a giant started to raise hell around the palace they hadn't even gotten the kid to the guardhouse yet but somehow in the confusion the boy got away one guard who wore a size seventeen uniform was knocked unconscious but no one else was hurt they dispersed the rowdies carried the guard to the infirmary and left the doctor saw him in the waiting room then left him there momentarily to look for an accident report slip in the supply room at the other side of the building he could have sworn that a whole pad of them had been lying on the desk when he'd stepped out for a bit ten minutes ago when the doctor returned with the slip the soldier was still there only he was stark naked a minute later an unfamiliar guard wearing a size seventeen uniform saluted the guard at the gate and marched in two strange men behind the gate flung a cord with a weight on one end over a third-story cornice 
They missed once, then secured it the second time and left it hanging there. A guard wearing a size 17 uniform came down the hall of the west wing of the castle, stopped before a large double door on which was a silver crown, indicating the room of the queen mother. He took a complete set of keys to the private suites of the royal family from his cloak and locked her majesty firmly in her room. At the next door, he locked Prince Let securely in his. Then he went rapidly on. Tell ran till he got to the corner, rounded it, and checked the street sign. It was correct. So he went to a doorway and sat down to wait. At the same time, Prince Let, getting ready for bed and wearing nothing but his undershirt, looked out the window and saw a girl with white hair hanging head down outside the shutter. He stood very still. The upside-down face smiled at him. Then the hands converged at the window lock did something, and the two glass panels came open. The girl rolled over once, turned quickly, and suddenly she was crouching on the window ledge. Let snatched up his pajama bottoms first, and ran to the door second. When he couldn't open it, he whirled around and pulled on his pajama pants. Alter put her finger to her lips as she stepped down into his room. Keep quiet, she whispered, and relax, she added. The Duchess of Petra sent me, more or less. She had been instructed to use that name to calm the prince. It seemed to work a trifle. Look, explained Alter, you're being kidnapped. It's for your own good, believe me. She watched the blonde boy come away from the door. Who are you? he asked. I'm a friend of yours, if you'll let me be. Where are you going to take me? You're going to go on a trip but you'll come back, eventually. What has my mother said? Your mother doesn't know. Nobody knows, except you and the Duchess, and the few people who are helping her. Let appeared to be thinking. He walked over to his bed, sat down, and pressed his hand against the sideboard. There was a tiny click. Nothing else happened. Why won't they open the door? he asked. It's been locked, Alter said. Suddenly, she looked at the clock beside the prince's bed and turned to the window. Light from the crystal chandelier caught on the shells that were strung on leather thongs around her neck as she turned. Let put his hand quietly on the newel post of his bed and pressed his thumb hard on the purple garnet that encrusted the crowning ornamental dolphin. Nothing happened except a tiny click. At the window, Alter reached out her hand just as a bundle appeared outside on a lowered rope. She pulled them in, untied them, and shook them out as the rope suddenly flew out the window again. Here, she said, get into these. It was a suit of rags. She tossed them to him. Finally, Let slipped out of his pajama pants and into the suit. Now look in your pocket, Alter said. The boy did and took out a bunch of keys. You can open the door with those, Alter said. Go on. Let paused, then went to the door. Before he put the key in the lock, though, he bent down and looked through the keyhole. Hey, he said, looking back at the girl. Come here. Do you see anything? Alter crossed the room, bent down, and looked. The only motion Let made was to lean against one of the panels on the wall, which gave a slight click. Nothing happened. I don't see anything, Alter said. Open the door. Let found the proper key, put it in the lock, and the door swung back. All right, you kids, said the guard who was standing on the other side of the door, who incidentally wore a size 17 uniform. You come along with me. He took Let firmly by one arm and Alter by the other and marched them down the hall. I'm warning you to keep quiet, the guard said to Let as they turned the last corner. Three minutes later, they were outside the castle. As the guard passed another uniformed man at the sentry's post, he said, More stupid kids trying to break into the palace. What a night, said the guard, and scratched his head. A girl, too? Looks like it, said the guard, who was escorting Alter and the prince. 
I'm taking them to be photographed. Sure, answered the guard, and saluted. The two children were marched down the street toward the guardhouse. Before they got there, they were turned off into a side street. Then suddenly, the guard was gone. A black-haired boy with green eyes was coming toward them. Is this the prince? Tell asked. Uh-huh, said Alter. Who are you? Let asked. Where are you taking me? My name is Tell. I'm a fisherman's son. My name is Alter. Alter introduced herself. She's an acrobat, Tell added. I'm the prince, Let said. Really, I'm Prince Let. The two others looked at the blonde boy who stood in front of them, in rags like their own. Suddenly, they laughed. The prince frowned. Where are you taking me? he asked again. We're taking you to get something to eat, and where you can get a good night's sleep, Alter answered. Come on. If you hurt me, my mother will put you in jail. Nobody's going to hurt you, silly, Tell said. Come on. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Captives of the Flame》by Samuel R. Delaney. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Six. The Duchess of Petra said, "Now your first direct assignment will be." Then the sudden green of beetle's wings, the red of polished carbuncle, a web of silver fire, lightning and blue smoke. Columns of jade caught red light through the great crack in the roof. The light across the floor was red. John felt that there were others with him, but he could not be sure. Before him, on a stone platform, three marble crescents were filled with pulsating shadows. John Koshar looked at them, and then away. There were many more columns, most broken. He saw a huge break in the sanctuary wall. Outside, he could look down on an immense red plain. At a scribe line, the plain changed color to an even more luminous red. Near the temple, a few geometrical buildings cast maroon pinions of shadow over the russet expanse. Suddenly, he realized that the further half of the plain was an immense red sea yet with a perfectly straight shoreline. Calmly, it rippled toward the bright horizon. At the horizon, filling up nearly a quarter of the sky, was what seemed to be a completely rounded mountain of dull red. No, it was a segment of a huge red disk, a great dull sun, lipping the horizon of the planet. Yet it was dim enough so that he could stare directly at it without blinking. Above it, the atmosphere was a rich purple. Then there was a voice from behind him, and he turned to the triple throne once more. Hail, hosts of earth, the voice began. The very shadows of the room were like red bruises on the stone. You are in the halls of an extinct city on Cretan Three. Twelve million years ago, this planet housed a civilization higher than yours today. Now it is dead, and only we are left, sitting on their thrones in the twilight of their dying, ruddy sun. Who are you? demanded John, but his voice sounded strange, distorted. As he bit the last word off, another voice broke in. What do you really want from us? Then a third voice. What are you going to do with us? John looked around but saw no one else. Suddenly, another picture, the picture of a world, a white desert, where the sky was deep blue, and each object cast double shadows, filled his mind. This isn't the world you took me to before, he exclaimed. No, came the quiet voice. This is not the world we took you to before. Listen, we are homeless wanderers of space. Our origin was not only in another galaxy, but in another universe, eternities ago. 
By way of this universe we can move from star to star without transversing any segment of time, unless we desire. Thus we have dwelt quietly in the dead cities of myriad suns till now. We have never tampered with any living species, though there is something in us that yearns for the extinct cultures. Recently, according to our standards, though still much older than your solar system, a dark force has come into the universe. It has evolved similarly to us, and also leaps among galaxies in moments. Yet it holds no culture sacred that it finds, and has already tampered with a score of civilizations. It is younger than we are, and can only exist in one individual at a time. Well, our entity has three lobes, so to speak. This rival thinks nothing of completely changing the mind of its host, giving deadly information, even new powers. We are bound only to ride with your minds, warn you, guide you, but changing your body before your minds, and that only to keep you from death. So it will be your own greed, your own selflessness that will eventually win or lose this battle. Therefore, it will be won or lost within the framework of your own civilization. Then tell us this, came a voice that was not John's. What is on the other side of the radiation barrier? But we have told you already, and you have guessed. Tormon is at war with an economic condition. Beyond the barrier is a civilization which is controlled by the Lord of the Flames. He is only in one member of their number, and any time he may move to another, although it is not likely. Are they our enemies? Your only enemies are yourselves, but he must be evicted nonetheless. To do that, all you must do is confront the individual who is bearing him, the three of you together but you must all be within seeing distance of him at once, for we work through your minds. What you cannot perceive, we cannot affect. How will we do this? One of you has already been made immune to the radiation barrier. So will the rest of you when it becomes necessary. This is what you will do for us, and it will also remove the threatening element of the unknown that distracts Toralman from her own problems. But why our planet? A voice asked. Yours is an ideal experimenting ground. Because of the great fire, your planet has many civilizations that are now completely isolated from one another. Many, however, are on a fairly high level. The radiation barriers that lace your planet will keep you isolated from them for some time. When the Lord of the Flames is finished with one empire, he may wish to try a different method on a basically similar civilization. For all your isolated empires have the same base. Marinor, Letpar, Calcibon, Aptor. These are all empires on your planet, of which you have never heard. But your first concern is Tormund. Will we remember all this? John said. You will remember enough. Goodbye. You know your task. The red haze in the deserted temple pulsed, and the jade columns flickered. Hands of blue smoke caught him and flung him through a lightning flash. Whirled through a net of silver, he dropped through red into the vivid green of beetles' wings. John blinked. The Duchess took a step backwards. The green carpet, the rich wood-paneled walls, the glass-covered desk. They were in a sitting-room of his father's house, again. Finally, John asked, Now, just what am I supposed to do, again? And explain it very carefully. I was going to say, said the Duchess, that you were to get to the prince, who is being kept at an inn in the devil's pot, and accompany him to the forest people. I want him to stay there until this war is over. They live a different life from any of the other people of this empire. They will give him something he'll be able to use. 
I told you I spent some time there when I was younger. I can't explain exactly what it is, but it's a certain ruggedness, a certain strength. Maybe they won't give it to him, but if he's got it in him, they'll bring it out. What about the Lord of the Flames? I don't. Do you have any idea, John? Well, assuming we get beyond the radiation barrier, assuming we find what people were fighting, assuming we find which one of them is carrying around the Lord of the Flames, and assuming we can all three of us get to him at once, assuming all that, there's no problem. But we can't, can we? Look, I'll be going to the forest, so I'll be closest to the radiation barrier. I'll try to get through, see what the situation is, and then the two of you can come on. All right? Fine. If nothing else, it'll put me closer to the Lord of the Flames and my freedom. How are you not free now, John Koshar? the Duchess asked. Instead of answering, he said, Give me the address of the inn at the Devil's Pot. Going down the hall with the address, John increased his pace. His mind carried an alien mind that had saved him from death once already. How could he be free? The obligation? That couldn't be the word. Around the corner, he heard a voice. And now, would you please explain it to me? It's not every day I'm called on to declare war. I think I did it rather eloquently. Now tell me why. John remembered the trick of acoustics, which, as a child, enabled him to stand in this spot and overhear his sister and her girlfriend's conversation, just as they came into the house. It's your brother, came the other voice. He's been kidnapped. He's been what? asked the king. And why? And by whom? We don't know, answered the official but the council thought it was best to get you to declare war. Oh, said the king, so that's why I made that little speech in there. What does mother say? It wouldn't be polite to repeat, sir. She was locked in her room and very insulted. She would be, said Usk. So the enemy has infiltrated and got my silly brother. Well, said the voice, they can't be sure, but what with the planes this morning, they thought it was best. Oh, well, said the king. There were footsteps, then silence. Coming round the corner, John saw the coat closet was ajar. He opened the door, took out a great cape and hood, and wrapped it around him, pulling the hood close over his head. He stepped into the foyer and went out past the doorman. At the edge of the devil's pot, the woman with the birthmark on the left side of her face was tapping a cane and holding out a tin cup. She had put on a pair of dark glasses and wandered up one street and down another. Money for a poor old blind woman, she said in a whiny voice. Money for the blind. As a coin clinked into her cup, she nodded, smiled, and said, Welcome to the new world. Good luck in the island of opportunity. The man who had given her the coin walked a step and then turned back. Hey, he said to Rara, if you're blind, how do you know I'm new here? Strangers are generous, Rara explained, while those who live here are too frozen to give. Look, said the man, I was told to watch out for blind beggars who weren't blind. My cousin, he warned me. Not blind, cried Rara. Not blind? Why, my license is right here. It permits me to beg in specified areas because of loss of sight. If you keep this up, I'll be obliged to show it to you. She turned away with a huff and began in another direction. The man scratched his head, then hurried off. A few moments later, a man completely swathed in a gray cloak and hood came around the corner and stopped in front of the woman. Money for the blind? Can you use this? The man said. From his cloak, he held out a brocade jacket, 
covered with fine metalwork. Of course, said Rara softly. Then she coughed. <laughs> what is it? It's a jacket, John said. It's made pretty well. Maybe you can sell it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. A few blocks later, a ragged boy, who looked completely amazed, was handed a white silk shirt by the man in the gray cloak. In front of a doorway, two blocks on, a pair of open-toed black boots with gold discs were left, and stolen from that doorway exactly forty seconds later by a hairdresser who was returning to her home in the devil's pot. She was missing the little finger of her left hand. Once the gray cloaked figure paused in an alley beneath a clothesline. Suddenly he flung up a ball of gray cloth, which caught on the line, unrolled, and became identifiable as a pair of dark gray trousers. A block later, the last minor articles of clothing were hurled unceremoniously through an open window. As John turned another corner, he glimpsed a figure ducking into a doorway down the dim street. The man was apparently following him. John walked very slowly down the next block, ambling along in the shadow. The hoodlum crept up behind him, then grabbed his cloak, ripped it away, and leapt forward. Only there wasn't anything there. The mugger stood for a moment, the cape dangling from his hand, blinking at the place a man should have been. Then something hit him in the jaw. He staggered back. Something else hit him in the stomach. As he stumbled forward now, beneath the street lamp, a transparent human figure suddenly formed in front of him. Then it planted its quite substantial fist into his jaw again, and he went back, down, and out. John dragged the man back to the side of the alley, fading out completely as he did so. Then he took the hoodlum's clothes, which were ragged, smelly, and painfully nondescript. The shoes, which were too small for him, he had to leave off. Then he flung the cape back around his shoulders and pulled the hood over his head. For the next six blocks, he was lost because there were no street signs. When he did find the next one, he realized he was only a block away from the end. As he reached the stone building, he heard a thud in the tiny alleyway beside it. A moment later, a girl's voice called softly. There, just like that. Only you better do exactly as I say, or you'll break your arms, or legs, or back. He walked to the edge of the building and peered into the alley. Her white hair loose, Alter stood looking up at the roof. All right, tell, she called. You next. Something came down from the roof, flipped over, on the ground at her feet, rolled away, and then suddenly unwound to a standing position. The black-haired boy ran his fingers through his hair. Wow, he said. Then he shook his head. Wow! Are you all right? Alter asked. You didn't pull anything, did you? No, he said. I'm all right, I think. Yeah, everything's in place. He looked up at the roof again, two stories above. Your turn, Let, Alter called up. It's high, came a childish voice from the roof. Hurry up, said Alter, her voice becoming authoritative. When I count three, and remember, knees up, chin down, and roll quick. One, two, three. There was a space of a breath, and then it fell, rolled, bounced unsteadily to its feet and resolved into another boy, this one blond and slighter than the first. Hey, you kids, John said. They turned. John looked at the smaller boy, his slight blond frame, less substantial than even Alter's white-haired loveliness, was definitely of the royal family. What are you doing out here anyway? John asked. Especially you, your highness. All three children jumped. It looked like they might balk, and after that descent from the roof, he wasn't sure where they might balk to. So he said, Incidentally, the Duchess of Petra sent me. How did you do that fall? 
His Highness was the only one to relax appreciably. And are you sure you're supposed to be outside? We were supposed to stay on the top floor, Tell said. But him, he pointed to his ragged highness, he got restless, and we started telling him about the tricks. And so we went up to the roof, and Alter said she could get us down. Can you get them back up? John asked. Sure, said Alter. All we do is climb... John held up his hand. Wait a minute, he said. We'll go inside and talk to the man in charge. Don't worry. No one will be mad. You mean talk to Jaron? said Alter. I guess that's what his name is. They started back out of the alley. Tell me, John said, just what sort of person is Jaron? He's a strange old man. He talks to himself all the time, said Alter. But he's smart. Talks to himself, John reflected, and nodded. When they reached the door of the inn, John pulled his cape off and stepped into the light. A few people at the bar turned around, and when they saw the children, they looked askance at one another. Jaron's probably upstairs, Alter said. They went to the second floor. John let the children go ahead of him as they passed into the shadow of the hall. He only stepped up to them when Alter pushed open the door at the end of the hall, and bright light from Jaron's room fell full across them. What is it? Jaron snapped. And then, what is it? Quick! He whirled around in the chair at the rough wooden desk when they entered. The giant was standing by the window. Jaron's gray eyes fidgeted back and forth. Finally, he said, Why are you out here? And who is he? What do you want? I'm from the Duchess of Petra, John said. I've come to take let to the forest people. Yes, said the old man. Yes. Then suddenly his face twisted as if he were trying to remember something, then shook his head. Yes. Suddenly he stood up. Well, go on. I've done my part, I tell you. I've done. Every minute he's in my house, he endangers my boarders, my friends. Take him. Go on. The giant turned from the window. I am to go with you. My name is Arkor. John frowned. For the first time, the scarred giant's height struck him. Why? He started. It is my country that we go to, said Arkor. I know how to get there. I can take you through it. Jaron says it's part of the plan. John felt a sudden knot of resentment tighten inside him. These plans, the Duchess's, Jaron's, even the plans of the triple beings who inhabited them, they trapped him. Freedom, the word went in and out of his mind like a shadow. He said, When do we go, then, if you know how to get there? In the morning, said Arthur. Alter, take him to a room. Get him out of here. Quick, go on. They backed from the room, and Alter hurried them up the hall. John was thinking. After delivering Let to the forest people, he was going further. Yes, he would go on, try to get through the radiation barrier. But all three of them had to get through if they were to do any good. So why wasn't Jaron coming instead of sending the giant? If Jaron came, then there'd be two people near the Lord of the Flames. But Jaron was old. Maybe the Duchess could bring him with her when she came. Mentally, he smashed a fist into his thoughts and scattered them. Don't think. Don't think. Thinking binds up your mind, and you can never be... He stopped. Then another thought wormed into his skull, the thought of five years of glittering hunger. That night he slept well. Morning pried his eyes open with blades of light that fell through the window. It was very early. He had been up only a minute when there was a knock on his door. Then it opened, and Arkor directed the dwarfed form of the prince into John's room, then turned and left. He says to meet him downstairs in five minutes, Let said. Sure, said John. 
He finished buttoning up the ragged shirt stolen from the mugger the night before, and looked at the boy by the door. "'I guess you're not used to these sort of clothes,' he said. Once I wasn't either. Pretty soon they began to take. "'Huh?' said Let. Then, "'Oh. Is something wrong?' "'Who are you?' John thought for a moment. "'Well,' he said, "'I'm sort of a friend of your brother. "'An acquaintance, anyway. "'I'm supposed to take you to the forest.' "'Why?' "'You'll be safe there. "'Could we go to the sea instead?' "'My turn for a why?' John asked. "'Because Tell told me all about it last night. "'He said it was fun.' He said there were rocks, all different colors, and in the morning, he said, you can see the sun come up like a burning blister behind the water. He told me about the boats, too. I'd like to work on a boat. I really would. They don't allow me to do anything at home. Mother says I might get hurt. Will I get a chance to work someplace? Maybe, John said. Tell had some good stories about fishing. Do you know any stories? I don't know, John said. I never tried telling any. Hey, come on, we better get started. I like stories, Let said. Come on, I'm just trying to be friendly. John laughed, then thought a minute. I can tell you a story about a prison mine. Do you know anything about the prison mines beyond the forest? Some, said Let. Well, once upon a time, there were three prisoners in that prison camp. He started out in the hall. They'd been there a long time, and they wanted to get out. One was, well, he looked like me. Let's pretend. Another had a limp. And the third one was chubby, sort of, interrupted Let. I know that story. You do? asked John. Sure, Let said. Then you go on and tell it. John was a little annoyed. Let told it to him. They were outside waiting for Arcor when the boy finished. See, Let said, I told you I knew it. Yeah, said John quietly. He stood very still. You say the other two didn't make it? That's right, Let said. The guards brought them back and dumped their bodies in the mud so that... Shut up, John said. Huh? asked Let. He was quiet for a few breaths. Who told you that story? Petra, Let answered. She told it to me. It's a good story, huh? Incidentally, John said, I'm the one that got away. You mean, the boy stopped. You mean it really happened? The early light warmed the deserted street now as arcor came to the door of the inn and stepped into the street all right he said come on end of chapter six one of captives of the flame by samuel r delaney this librivox recording is in the public domain Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 7 The news service of Toramon in the city of Toron was a public address system that flooded the downtown area, and a special printed sheet that was circulated among the upper families of the city. On the mainland, it was a fairly accurate brigade of men and women who transported news orally from settlement to settlement all announced simultaneously that morning crown prince kidnapped king declares war in the military ministry directives were issued in duplicate and and redelivered in triplicate at eight forty the twenty seven b communications sector became hopelessly snarled this resulted in the shipment of a boatload of prefabricated barracks foundations to a port on the mainland, 62 miles from the intended destination. Let John and Arcor 
were just mounting the private yacht of the Duchess of Petra, which was waiting for them at the end of the harbor. Later, as the island of Torum slipped across the water, Let mentioned to John, leaning against the railing, that there was an awful lot of commotion on the docks. It's always like that, John told him, remembering the time he'd gone with his father in the morning to the pier. They're inspecting cargoes, but it does look awfully busy. Which was a euphemism. One group of military directives, which had been quite speedily and accurately delivered, were the offers of contracts, primarily for food, and secondarily for equipment. Two of the distributors of imported fish, who had absolutely no chance of receiving the contracts, sent in a bid, accompanied by a letter which explained, with completely fraudulent statistics, how much cheaper it would be to use imported fish rather than those from the aquariums. Then they commandeered a group of ruffians who broke into the house of old Koshar's personal secretary, who was still sleeping after the previous night's party, which he had helped out with. So far, he has appeared in the story only as a hand seen around the edge of a storage cabinet door, a broad hand with wiry black hair on which there was a cheap, wide brass ring in which was set an irregular shape of blue glass. They tied him to a chair, punched him in the stomach, and in the head, and in the mouth, until there was blood running down his trimmed black beard, and he had given the information they wanted. Information that enabled them to sink three of the Koshar cargo fleet that was just coming into dock. The Duchess's private yacht made contact with a Tetron tramp returning to the mainland, and let John and Arcor changed ships. Coming from the yacht in bare feet and rags gave them an incongruous appearance, but on the tramp, among those passengers who were returning for their families, they quickly became lost. On Toron, the pilot of the shuttle boat that took workers from the city to the aquariums found a clumsily put together but nevertheless unmistakable bomb hidden in the lavatory. It was dismantled. There was no accident. But an authority, Vice Supervisor Nitum of Kosher Synthetic Food Concerns, whose name you do not need to remember, as he was killed three days later in a street brawl, clenched his jaw unshaven. He had been called to the office a half an hour early over the sunken cargo boats, nodded his head, and issued a few non-official directives himself. Twenty minutes later, Koshar Synthetic Food Concerns was officially given the government contract to supply the armies of Toroman with food. Because the two rival bidders, the import merchants, had ceased to exist about twelve minutes previously, having suddenly been denied warehouse space and their complete storage dumped into the streets to rot nearly seven tons of frozen fish. Because the refrigeration lockers and the refrigeration buildings and the refrigeration trucks had all been rented from Rossock Refrigeration, and no one had ever thought of spelling Rossock backwards. In the military ministry, Captain Clemen, along with Major Tomon, was called away from his present job of completing the evacuation of the top four floors of an adjacent office building to accommodate the new corps of engineers, mathematicians, and physicists that the army had just enlisted. Apparently, riots had started in the streets around the old Rossock refrigeration houses. The warehouses were just a few blocks away from the official boundary of the Devil's Pot. They got there ten minutes after the report came in. What the hell is going on? Clemen demanded, from the head of the city dispersal squad. Behind the line of uniformed men, masses of people were pushing and calling out. And what's that stench? added Clemen. He was a tiny man, exactly a quarter of an inch over the minimum for military acceptance, four foot ten. Fish, sir, 
the dispersal chief told him. There's tons of it all over the street. The people are trying to take it away. Well, let them have it, Clement said. It'll clear the streets of the mess and maybe do some good. You don't understand, sir, the head of dispersal explained. It's been poisoned. Just before it was dumped, it was soaked with buckets of barbitide. Half a ton of the stuff's already been carried away. Clement turned. Tomar, he said. You get back to headquarters and see personally that a city-wide announcement goes out telling about the poison fish. Call General Medical. Find out the antidote and get the information all over the city. See to it personally, too. Tomar got back to headquarters, got General Medical, got the antidote, which was expensive, complicated, and long, and drafted his announcement. Warning! Any citizen who has taken fish from the street in the area of Rossack refrigeration is in immediate danger of death. The fish has been treated with the fatal poison barbitide. No fish other than that directly traceable to the synthetic markets should be eaten. Warn your neighbors. If fish has been eaten, go directly to the general medical building. Address followed. Symptoms of barbitide poisoning. Intense cramps about two hours after ingestion, followed by nausea, fever, and swollen lymph nodes. Death results in 20 minutes after onset of cramps under normal conditions. Foods with high calcium contents prolong spasms to a maximum hour and a half. Foods such as milk, ground eggshell. General medical has been alerted you will receive injections of calcium silicate and atropaic acid, which can counteract the effects of the poison up until the last five or ten minutes. Tomar personally sent the directive through Communication Center 27B, marked Urgent and Emergency. Ten minutes later, he received a visiphone call from the communications engineer saying that 27B had been hopelessly snarled all morning. In fact, so had 26B, 25B. In further fact, said the engineer, the only available sectors open were 34A and 42A, none of which, incidentally, had access to complete city lines. Tomar made a triplicate copy of the warning and sent it out. Nonetheless, through sectors 40A, 41A, and 42A. A half an hour later, the secretary to the communications engineer called and said, Major Tomar, I'm sorry, I just got back from my break, and I didn't see your message until just now. Because of the tie-ups, we've received instructions only to let authorized persons have access to the available sectors. Well, who the hell is authorized? Tomar bellowed. If you don't put that through, and quick, half the city may be dead by this evening. The secretary paused a minute. Then he said, I'm sorry, sir, but, well, look, I'll give it directly to the communications engineer when he gets back. When is he getting back? Tomar demanded. I, I don't know. Who is authorized? Only generals, sir, and only those directly concerned with the war effort. I see, Tomar said, and hung up. He had just dispatched seven copies of the announcement with an explanatory note to seven of the fourteen generals in the ministry when the communications engineer called again. Major, what's all this about a bushel of fish? Look! There are seven tons of the stuff all over the streets. And poisoned? Exactly. Will you please see that this message gets out over every available piece of city-wide communication as fast as possible? This is really life and death. We're just allowed to work on getting war messages through, but I guess this takes priority. Oh, that explains some of the messages we've been getting. I believe there's even one for you. 
Well? asked Tomar after a pause. I'm not allowed to deliver it, sir. Why not? You're not authorized, sir. Look, damn it, get it right now and read it to me. Well, uh, uh, it's right here, sir. It's from the chief of the city dispersal squad. The message was, in brief, that twenty-three men, among them Captain Clemen, had been trampled to death by an estimated two and a half thousand hungry residents of the Devil's Pot, most of them immigrants from the mainland. A ton and a half of fish was finally removed from the streets and disposed of, but five and a half tons had made its way through the city. The communications engineer also added that while they'd been talking, a memorandum had come through that sectors 34A to 42A were now out of commission, but that the Major should try 27B again, because it might have cleared up. The second shift of workers that day was arriving at the aquariums. In the great pontoon building, vast rows of transparent plastic tubes, three feet in diameter, webbed back and forth among the tetron pumps. Vibrator nets cut the tubes into twenty-foot compartments. Catwalks strung the six-story structure, all flooded with deep red light that came from the phosphor rods that stuck up from the pumps. Light toward the blue end of the spectrum disturbed the fish, who had to be visible at all times, to be moved, or to be checked for any sickness or deformity. In their transparent tubes, the fish floated in a state near suspended animation, vibrated gently, were kept at a constant 82 degrees, were fed, were fattened, were sorted according to age, size, and species, then slaughtered. The second shift of workers moved into the aquarium, relieving the first shift. They had been on about two hours when a sweating hulk of a man who was an assistant feeder reported to the infirmary, complaining of general grogginess. Heat prostration was an occasional complaint in the aquarium. The doctor told him to lie down for a little while. Five minutes later, he went into violent cramps. Perhaps the proper attention would have been paid to him had not, a few minutes later, a woman fallen from a catwalk at the top of the aquarium and broken one of the plastic arteries and her skull six stories below. In the red light, the workers gathered around her broken body that lay at the end of a jagged plastic tube. In the spread water, dozens of fish, fat and ruddy-skinned, flapped their gills weakly. The woman's co-workers said she had complained of not feeling well, when suddenly she went into convulsions while crossing one of the catwalks. By the time the doctor got back to the infirmary, the assistant feeder had developed a raging fever, and the nurse reported him violently nauseated. Then he died. In the next two hours, out of the 5,280 people who worked at the aquariums, 387 were taken with cramps and died in the next two hours, the only exception being an oddball physical culture enthusiast who always drank two quarts of milk for lunch. He lasted long enough to be gotten onto the shuttle and back to General Medical on Toron, where he died six minutes after admittance, one hour and seventeen minutes after the onset of the cramps. That was the first case that General Medical actually received. It was not until the sixteenth case that the final diagnosis of barbitide poisoning was arrived at. Then someone remembered the query that had come in by phone from the military ministry that morning about the antidote. Somehow, said Chief Toxologist Una, the stuff has gotten into some food or other. It may be all over the city. Then he sat down at his desk and drafted a warning to the citizens of Toron containing a description of the effects of barbitide poisoning, antidote, and instructions to come to the general medical building, along with a comment on high calcium foods. 
Send this to the military ministry and get it out over every available source of public communications, and quick, he told his secretary. When the assistant communications engineer, the first having gone off duty at three o'clock, received the message, he didn't even bother to see who it was from, but balled it up in disgust and flung it into a waste paper basket and mumbled something about unauthorized messages. Had the janitor bothered to count that evening, he would have discovered that there were now thirty-six copies of Major Tomar's directive in various waste baskets around the ministry. Only a fraction of the barbitide victims made it to general medical, but the doctors were busy. There was just one extraordinary incident, and among the screams of cramped patients, it was not given much thought. Two men near the beginning of the rush of patients gained access to the special receiving room. They managed to get a look at all the women who arrived. One of the patients who was wheeled by them was a particularly striking girl of about fifteen, with snow-white hair and a strong, lithe body, now knotted with cramps. Sweat beaded her forehead, her eyelids, and through her open collar you could see she wore a leather necklace of shells. That's her, one of the men said. The other nodded, then went to the doctor who was administering the injections and whispered to him. Of course not, the doctor said indignantly in a clear voice. Patients need at least forty-eight hours rest and careful observation after injection of the antidotes. Their resistance is extremely low and complications... The man said something else to the doctor and showed him a set of credentials. The doctor stopped, looked scared, then left the patient he was examining and went to the bed of the new girl. Quickly, he gave her two injections. Then he said to the men, I want you to know that I object to this completely and I will... All right, doctor, the first man said. Then the second hoisted Alter from the cot and they carried her out of the hospital. The Queen Mother had her separate throne room. She sat in it now, looking at photographs. In bright colors, two showed the chamber of the crown prince. In one picture, the prince was seated on his bed, in his pajama pants, with his heel against the sideboard. Standing by the window was a white-haired girl with a leather necklace strung with tiny bright shells. The next showed the prince, still sitting on the bed, this time with his hand on the newel dolphin. The girl was just turning toward the open window. The third picture, which, from the masking, seemed to have been taken through a keyhole, showed what seemed to be an immense enlargement of a human pupil. Mistily discernible through the iris were the dottings and tiny pathways of a retina pattern. On the broad arm of the Queen Mother's throne was a folder marked Alter Ronid. In the folder were a birth certificate, a clear photograph of the same retina pattern, a contract in which a traveling circus availed itself of the service of a group of child acrobats for the season, a school diploma, copies of receipts covering a three-year period of gymnastic instruction, a copy of a medical bill for the correction of a sprained hip, and two change-of-address slips. Also, there were several cross-reference slips to the files of Alia Ronid, mother, deceased, and Rara Ronid, maternal aunt, legal guardian. The queen put the photographs on top of the folder and turned to the guards. There were thirty of them lined against the walls of the room. She lifted up the heavy jeweled scepter and said, Bring her in! She touched the two buns of white hair on the sides of her head, breathed deeply, and straightened in the chair as two doors opened at the other end of the room. Two blocks had been set up in the middle of the room, about four feet high and a foot apart. Alter stumbled once, but the guard caught her. They walked her between the blocks, which came to just below her shoulders, spread her arms over the surface, and strapped them straight across the tops, at the biceps and wrist. 
The queen smiled. That's only a precaution. We want to help you. She came down the steps of the throne, the heavy jeweled rod cradled in her arm. Only we know something about you. We know that you know something which, if you tell me, will make me feel a great deal better. I've been very upset recently. Did you know that? Alter blinked and tried to get her balance. The blocks were just under the proper height by half an inch, so that she could neither stand completely, nor could she sag. We know you're tired, and after your ordeal with the barbitide, you don't feel well, do you? asked the queen, coming closer. Alter shook her head. Where did you take my son? the queen asked. Alter closed her eyes, then opened them wide and shook her head. Believe me, said the queen, we have ample proof. Look. She held up the photographs for Alter to see. My son took these pictures of the two of you together. They're very clear, don't you think? She had put the pictures back in the quilted pocket of her robe. Aren't you going to tell me now? I don't know anything, Alter said. Come now. That room had as many cameras as a sturgeon has eggs. There are dozens of hidden switches. Somehow the alarms connected with them didn't go off, but the cameras still worked. Alter shook her head again. You don't have to be afraid, said the queen. We know you're tired, and we want to get you back to the hospital as soon as possible. Now, what happened to my son, the prince? Silence. You're a very sweet girl. You're an acrobat, too. Alter swallowed and then coughed. The queen gave a puzzled smile this time. Really, you don't have to be afraid to answer me. You are an acrobat, isn't that right? Alter nodded. The queen reached out and slowly lifted the triplet leather necklace with its scattering of shells in her fingers. This is a beautiful piece of jewelry. She lifted it from Alter's neck. An acrobat's body must be like a fine jewel, fine and strong. You must be very proud of it. Again she paused and tilted her head. I am only trying to put you at ease, dear. Make conversation. Smiling, she lifted the necklace completely from around Alter's neck. Oh, this is exquisite. Suddenly, the necklace clattered to the ground, the shells making an almost miniature sound against the tiles. Alter's eyes followed the necklace to the floor. Oh! the queen said. I'm terribly sorry. It would be a shame to break something like this. With one hand, the queen drew back her robes until her shoe was revealed. Then she moved her foot forward until her raised toe was over the necklace. Will you tell me where my son is? There were seven, eight, ten seconds of silence. Very well the queen said, and brought her foot down. The sound of crushed shells was covered by Alter's scream. Because the queen had brought down the scepter, too, the full arc of its swing, onto Alter's strapped forearm. Then she brought it down again. The room was filled with the scream and the crack of the jeweled scepter against the surface of the block. Then the queen smashed Alter's upturned elbow joint. When there was something like silence, the queen said, Now, where is my son? Alter didn't say for a long while. When she did, they were ready to believe anything. So what she told them didn't do much good when they had time to check it. Later, unconscious, she was carried into the general medical building, wrapped in a gray blanket. "'Another fish-poison case?' asked the clerk. The man nodded. 
The doctor, who had been there when Alter was removed from the hospital, had been working steadily for six hours. When he unwrapped the blanket, he recognized the girl. When he unwrapped it further, the breath hissed between his lips, and then hissed out again, slowly. Get this girl to emergency surgery, he said to the nurse. Quickly! In the devil's pot, Tell had just gotten over a case of the runs which had kept him away from food all day. Feeling hungry now, he was foraging in the cold storage cabinet of the inn's kitchen. In the freezing chest, he found the remains of a baked fish, so he got a sharp knife from over the sink and cut a piece. Then the door opened and the barmaid came in. She was nearly seventy years old and wore a red scarf around her stringy neck. Tell had cut a slice of onion and was putting it on top of the fish when the barmaid ran forward and knocked the dish from his hand. Ouch! Tell said and jumped, though nothing had hurt him. Are you completely crazy? the woman asked. You want to be carried out of here like the rest of them? Tell looked puzzled as Rara entered the kitchen. Good grief, she declared. Where is everybody? I'm starved. I started selling that home-brew tonic of mine that I made up yesterday, and around noon, suddenly, everybody was buying the stuff. They wanted something for cramps, and I guess my super aqueous tonic is as good as anything else. I couldn't even get back to eat. Is there some sort of epidemic? Say, that looks good. And she went for the fish. The old barmaid snatched up the dish and carried it to the disposal can. It's poisoned, don't you understand? She dumped it into the chute. It's got to be the fish that's causing it. Everybody who ate it has been carried off to general medical with cramps. Lots of them died, too. The woman who lives across the street and me, we figured it out. We both bought it from the same woman this morning. And that's all it could be. Well, I'm still hungry, Tell said. Can we have some cheese and fruit? asked Rara. I guess that's safe, the woman said. Who was carried out? Tell wanted to know, looking back in the cabinet. Oh, that's right, the barmaid said. You've been upstairs sick all day. And then she told him. At about the same time, an observer in a scouting plane noticed a boat bearing prefabricated barracks foundations some sixty miles away from any spot that could possibly be receiving such a shipment. In fact, he had sent a corrective order on a typographical error concerning, yes, it must be, that same boat. He sent it that morning through Communication Sector 27B. They were near the shore, one of the few spots away from the fishing villages and the farm communes where the great forest had crept down to the edge of the water itself. A tiny port, occasionally used as an embarkation for the families of immigrants going to join people in the city, was the only point of civilization between the rippling smoke-green sea on one side and the crinkling deep green of the forest treetops on the other. The observer also noted that a small Tetron tramp was about to dock also. But that transport ship, he called the pilot and requested contact be made. The pilot was shaking his head, groggily. The co-pilot was leaning back in his seat, his mouth opened, his eyes closed. I don't feel to... The pilot started and then reached forward absently to crumple a sheet of tinfoil he had left on the instrument panel in which a few hours ago had been a fillet sandwich that he and the co-pilot had shared between them suddenly the pilot fell forward out of his chair knocking the control stick way to the left he clutched his stomach as the plane banked suddenly to the right in the observation blister the observer was thrown from his chair, and the microphone fell from his hand. The co-pilot woke up, belched, 
grabbed for the stick, which was not in its usual place, and so missed. Forty-one seconds later, the plane had crashed into a dock some thirty feet from the mooring Tetron Tramp. End of chapter 7